Bismillah, alhamdulillah. You're watching Lifting the Fog. And I'm your host, Yusuf Estes. For the next few minutes, we want to talk on the subject of removing and clearing up some of the misconceptions, misunderstandings, and misrepresentations about Islam and what Islam teaches. Our program today is going to be a continuation of a program we were doing earlier on the subject of the treatment of women in Islam. We mentioned in our other program that there's a chapter of the Quran called An-Nisa, meaning the women. This is a whole section of Quran dedicated to the better understanding of what we said about rights and limitations in Islam. We also discovered in our previous program that in fact women have rights that they were never afforded before Islam came. Also, men had limits that they had never experienced prior to Islam. And together, these two together, the rights and the limits, bring about a whole way of life. We also discovered that in general, this is the way Islam approaches everything, showing you the rights and showing you the limits. I recall that when I was still a Christian, when I encountered the person that helped me get to Islam, that that was some of the most important part of his talks, his speeches to me, were on the subject of rights. I recall one of the times we were together and he was talking about the heart of a human being, regardless of whether it was a Muslim, a Christian, a Jew, or any person. But the heart of the human being is something so dear to Allah that he does not like anybody to even scratch the dignity of a person's heart. And when he used that term, I said, what a beautiful teaching. Don't even scratch a person's dignity because you hurt the heart. You've done an amazing thing, something not good whatsoever. I recall also talking about the rights. Constantly, Islam is coming up with what is the rights of a particular part of Allah's creation. Of course, we mentioned in our previous program, the first rights in Islam are Allah's rights. His right to be worshipped alone without partners. That's number one. And of course, the saying in Islam is, La ilaha illallah. There is none that has the right to be worshipped. Only Allah. And all worship is only for Him. La sharik Allah. He has no partners. After that is the right of Muhammad to be regarded as a messenger and servant of Almighty God, as such to follow these teachings that he's presenting Muhammad or Rasulullah. And then after that is the rights that the parents have over us. Then after that is the rights that we have in our family, the rights that we have as being husbands and wives and children. And of course, the other side is the limits, the limits, the limits. Without the limits, what are the rights? And so Islam is bringing this beautiful balance. Now, when we talk about women, and this is specifically what we want to do tonight, someone came to me one time and they said, how can you be in a religion that allows a 53-year-old man to have sex with a 6-year-old girl? A'udhu Billah. As soon as I heard this, I was so angry. I felt inside that I, I was going to explode. How could somebody say such a statement? It indicated, it indicated to me that, that this is a person who either doesn't understand real Islam or else this is a person who's trying to start a fight because this is not something tolerated, tolerated in Islam at all. Even now talking about it, I, I feel it again because... It's a lie, number one, and it misrepresents everything Islam is all about. But let's break it down. Suppose somebody came to you with that, and well, what would you do? I hope that you would benefit from these programs. I hope I benefit from it as well for this, to learn how to control ourselves when people approach us with that. We must not react, not, not react in kind. What we have to do is be even kinder. Somebody comes to you with this question. How can you be in a religion where a 53-year-old man has sex with a 6-year-old girl? Remember this. The Prophet ﷺ, peace be upon him, was attacked much harsher 
by the people of Ataif. So it's up to us to respond like this. Thank you for asking me about my religion. Now they're going to go, huh? Thank you for asking me about my religion. In Islam, it's forbidden for us to lie. If we lie, we can go to hell forever. And Islam, we have the proof. We have the clear evidences. The texts have been authenticated and preserved for 1,400 years. Even if I did lie, you could prove quickly that that's incorrect. So we have the truth and we have the proof. But we have something else too. What we have here is a way to present the wisdom or the hikmah of an answer. And that's now going to be your responsibility to show the people the real truth of Islam. And you do that by looking in, examining the question itself. Is there, in fact, in the question, a false statement? Because if that's the case, then we have to straighten the question out before we can answer it. And then ask them, while we're giving the answer, if you hear something that you like, and you say, gee whiz, that's, that's nice, I didn't know that. And you admire it, and you say, yeah, I want that for me. Then are you going to be prepared to reconsider your position and consider worshiping your God and my God and your Lord and my Lord, worshiping Him on His terms without partners? Because you see, in fact, that's all Islam is about anyway. Worshiping God, doing what He wants you to do. But now let's come back to your question. You ask me about an age difference, 53 and 6, and you ask about specifically a verb, an action, which is sex. To have sex. I will share with you something. That if the question contains a mistake in it, I can't answer it. Example. If you came to me and you said, By the way, Yusuf, is your mother out of jail yet? Yes or no? This is the two choices. Yes or no? How can I answer this question? My mother's never been in jail. Oh, nope. Yes or no? Is she out of jail? Well, she's not in jail. Therefore, she's out of jail. Okay, my mother's out of jail. Good, I'm glad she got out. She never was in. So no matter how I answer this question, it's a trap. I can't answer a question like that. Because it has what? It has a lie in the question. So let's go back and look again. The verb, the act of sex. If somebody said, does your religion permit a 53-year-old man to have sex with a 6-year-old girl? The answer is no. Because in Islam, it is not permitted a man of any age to have sex with a woman of any age. There is no sex in Islam except through what? Legitimate contractual marriage. There has to be something which is legitimate in Islam established for the benefit of the woman and the benefit of the man because of the rights and the limits that we've been talking about. The mistake here is to forget when we're talking to these people, they're meaning one thing and we mean something else. We're considering, as Muslims, they're talking about the relationship of a man and a woman in marriage. Whereas they're just talking about sex, period. This is a mentality that is derived from years and years of being exposed to television and movies and periodicals, magazines, newspaper, radio, etc., and these trash magazines at the checkout counter of the grocery store, sex, sex, sex. This is on their brain. It's not permitted in Islam. We don't have boyfriends and girlfriends. We don't have mistresses. We don't have these prostitutes, I'm sorry to say, but we don't have these kinds of things in Islam. This is not a part of Islam. It's all forbidden. What do we have? What we have in Islam is marriage. And that's it. If a man is married, it is forbidden for him to have a girlfriend or to have a mistress. Any of these kinds of things or just what they call one night stand. All of these things are so forbidden in Islam, a man can be punished severely for such a thing as this. And of course, I have to tell you, the same is true for the woman. If the woman would engage in something outside of marriage, she likewise can be punished. It's in the Islamic law. Marriage is a sacred, sacred thing in Islam from the standpoint that once you enter into this contract, you don't break.